today's episode, we are going to be thinking about how to communicate with neurodiverse children, or indeed adults like myself, without making their brains melt. Let's get started. Okay, we should start by saying that I have broken tip number one, rule number one, guidance number one, whatever you want to call it, by suggesting in the intro that we're going to not make neurodiverse people's brains melt. To clarify for any neurodiverse friends, our brains don't actually melt. But what I'm talking about here is that idea of kind of feeling really overwhelmed by the communications around us, feeling unable to process them as quickly as they're coming, trying to figure out what on earth is going on and feeling like we're still on step one when everyone else has worked to about step 83 and we're still thinking, do brains actually melt then or is that an idiom? don't know. So these communication tips are for supporting people who, again, like me, might appear to really know what's going on. Maybe they're the master of masking. Maybe they're good at the nod and the smile and they found strategies for making it all kind of work. That doesn't mean they're not inwardly really struggling to keep up. And also these acknowledge the fact that our autistic, our ADHD population, community, friends, family, students are not stupid. We've just got a heck of a lot going on in our brains. So one thing I just want you to bear in mind when communicating with your neurodiverse children, friends, family, students, colleagues, is that we're doing a lot of processing all the time. So the kind of the basic tenet of good communication with neurodiverse people is keep it simple. Basically treat us like we're a little bit stupid. And that does kind of work. It gets the appropriate outcome, but it's the wrong mindset from your point of view. What you actually need to remember is that we live in really complicated worlds where you maybe can just focus on the main task in hand. We, meanwhile, are distracted by a faint smell of food cooking three rooms away, or the fact that there's a clock ticking that sounds like a jackhammer to us, or the fact that the temperature in the room has just ever so slightly changed, or the fact that Amelie over there is writing and her pencil is really, really scratchy on the piece of paper, or the fact that you just said the word apples and it triggered a whole load of really deep sensory memories for us about that time that we picked apples in our grandma's garden and then we picked one and then there was a worm and did you know that worms... Da, 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 it, we just have a lot going on in our heads. So even quite simple instructions and communications can trigger lots of stuff that we're having to process and think. Add to all that the fact that every time we're having any kind of conversation and interaction, we're generally trying to second guess how to make that work because we don't understand the rules completely and sort of intuitively as other people might do. So we're thinking, Am I holding my body right? Am I making appropriate eye contact? Did I say a totally socially inappropriate thing? Was that a joke? Am I meant to laugh? All that's going on as well. So there's loads going on. Okay, so the context is we're not stupid. There's a whole ton going on in our head. There are things you can do to help us. Here's what you can do. I'm going to share six ideas. They're super simple. And I will also make a little um, kind of print-offable, downloadable summary of these six, should you want it. Something pretty. You know, I love to make something pretty. So number one, use concrete language. So I said in my intro, I broke rule number one uh, by saying that we're going to avoid brain melt. Okay, we're going to avoid brain melt by using concrete language. We are going to say what we actually mean. We're not going to use any kind of language that has any possibility of being misinterpreted if at all possible. So taking an example, I'm doing some work at the moment around death and dying. Um, we would not talk about someone passing away, going to sleep, being lost, kicking the bucket, any of these things we would instead say, and I think this is really good practice with every child, not just those with special needs. We would say, this person is dead, this person is dying. This is what our neurodiverse children need to hear in order to actually understand what you've said. Now, the tricky thing with this is that in everyday life, there's a whole ton of stuff that we say that we don't mean. And you will, if you become more aware of it, notice that you do these things all the time. And some of them, it's OK, we learn them over time. But 
for you know to be as helpful as you possibly can try to avoid using anything that's not literal where you can it makes life just so much easier for us if you just say what you mean sounds simple right okay so that's number one concrete language say what you mean number two is to keep things short and simple If you are going to issue me with some instructions, perhaps you're my teacher and we are going to be making something and you're going to tell me how to make that thing. I need to know in the simplest possible way, broken down into very short, simple steps, exactly what I need to do. I need to know nothing more than that because every additional word or superfluous instruction or embellishment that you give me gives me more stuff that I've got to analyze, interpret, work through, make sense of. So we break it right down to the very basics. What's the absolute minimum that you need to tell me? Think about it like you were going to do a presentation and you'd think about what you would put on your PowerPoint slides. So everybody knows, though not everybody does it, everybody knows that a great PowerPoint slide has got very few words on it, but they're really clear. It's really obvious what it is that they are saying. They'll be short, succinct, to the point. They say exactly what needs to be said, but they don't say anything more. That's exactly what we're looking for when you're giving instructions or explaining something to a neurodiverse child to keep it short and keep it simple and chunk it down into steps. So short, simple chunks. So far, so good. So we're keeping it concrete. We're saying what we mean. We're keeping it in short, simple, little chunks. Number three is talk and then stop. Well, that was awkward, wasn't it? It feels really awkward when it goes silent. And the thing is that for you, that that silence feels like it needs to be filled. But for the child, it's unlikely to be silent. I say the child, these tips are just as applicable when working with adults or talking to adults. That silence will be filled by our heads, by the constant questioning and wondering and general processing that's going on in our heads. So our heads are noisy all the time. We're not going to be worried about that silence. Other than that, you providing that silence, you stopping after you speak will give us some sort of opportunity to catch up to what you were saying. And if you speak and then you stop, count to 10 slowly, if you speak and then you stop, then I've got some chance of understanding point number one before you get to point number two. Otherwise, and this happens all the time, what happens is you've made point number one and I'm there. I really want to get this right. I'm focusing on it. I'm trying to learn from you and I've got it and you're on point four and I've missed two and three in the meantime. And it's not because you've explained them badly that you've done anything especially wrong. It's just that it takes me a little bit longer. And so I just need a moment. So speak and then stop. Try to resist the urge to jump in and fill that gap. The world does not need to be continuously filled with our voices, she says, recording a podcast where she speaks all the time. I am aware of the irony klaxon that should be going off here. But speak and then stop. Count to 10 slowly would be my tip. Number four is it's okay to repeat what you say. So you might need to. You might need to tell us more than once the same instruction in order for us to actually hear what you've said, to clarify it, to really understand it. So it's okay to repeat things. It's okay to repeat things many times. We won't find that offensive generally, although, you know, once you've met one neurodiverse person, you've met one neurodiverse person, do check that you're not annoying or offending the person that you're working with. But generally speaking, repetition is okay. We may, from the first time you said it, have been just so focused on a smell in the room that we didn't even really hear it the first time. Or, you know, it's okay to repeat stuff. It might drive you a little bit mad and it might make you feel like you're treating us like we're stupid, which might seem disrespectful. But sometimes just repeating something is the most useful thing you can do. One of the reasons why I like creating online content that can be kind of captured and recording is because I learn by watching and re-watching and re-watching stuff. Like I read intensely all the time, but I read and reread and reread. It, it takes me just a few more attempts at stuff to kind of process 
face and get it than it does for other people. And that's a mixture of um, autism and dyslexia at play there. And, you know, many of your neurodiverse uh, children, adults, friends, whoever, will have complex profiles where all this stuff interacts. I, I have a feeling that, like, in... 10, 20, 30 years, we'll look back at this time and go, oh, how quaint. They didn't understand how all the neurodiversities interacted because so many of us have a whole bunch of them. Um, and there's got to be reasons why. And we will understand that interplay a lot better one day. But the thing for you to know right now is that you may be working with someone, supporting someone who's got a whole bunch of different stuff going on. And this need to support with their processing may be multifaceted. So we are going to repeat as we need to, it's okay, we don't mind, and check for understanding. So one of the temptations when you're communicating with someone who doesn't seem to be quite getting it or who you worry about whether they're going to get it is to say something, to give an instruction or an explanation, and then right away, if they don't reply or they don't seem to have got it, to explain that in a different way. And for some people, that's a really helpful thing. For many of us who are neurodiverse, it's a really unhelpful thing because now not only am I trying to process what you said the first time, I'm now also trying to process what you said the second time. And if those things are a bit different, I'm, you know, that doubles the workload for me. So I'd much rather you repeat exactly what you said the first time. You might repeat it more slowly. You might give a little bit more space. You might say, does that make sense to you? Would you like me to explain it in a different way? And if we say, actually, yeah, I didn't really get that. Can you explain it in a different way or can you repeat it? Then by all means, please do so. One thing I would say here, when we're checking for understanding, we need to work really hard. And this is over time, not an instant thing, but we need to work really hard to create an environment where it's OK for the person that you're talking to or teaching to say, yeah, I didn't understand that. Actually, can you help me? Because we need to be able to ask you to repeat, to ask you to rephrase, to ask you to clarify or, or what have you. And that can feel difficult if you're in a relationship where there's a clear hierarchy. Maybe you're the teacher or teaching assistant and I'm the student. I might feel that I can't question you. I might feel that it's not OK to say what you said wasn't good enough. Basically, I didn't didn't get it. I don't understand. Um, and so I might do the thing that we all do every day and mask and nod and smile and pretend it's all right. And it might only become apparent to you that I've not actually understood when I fail to do the thing that you've asked me or my understanding does not come through in the next bit of the learning or I seem to be struggling as the conversation goes on. So trying to create an environment where you welcome that feedback from the person that you're talking to, where you say, you know, I, I hope that I've explained that right, but I don't always. So if you need me to repeat it or if you'd like me to clarify it, just let me know. Just being open to it and then also role modelling that. So sometimes when they're talking to you saying, oh, I really want to actually like properly understand what you're telling me, but I didn't quite get that last bit. Would you mind telling me again or can you rephrase it a little bit or can you explain a bit more about x show them the behavior that you would like to see from them in the other direction role model it so it's okay to repeat it's okay to check for understanding invite them to let you know if they've misunderstood and if you kind of agree it between you, then you might rephrase things, but don't automatically do that because it gives us more to process while we're still working on thing one. OK, so we've had our concrete language. We're saying what we mean. We've kept it short and simple. We've spoken, then we've stopped. We've repeated what we are saying many times if we need to, and we've checked for understanding. Number five is to share our communications in multiple formats. So what can be superbly helpful for our neurodiverse learners is not just to have verbal instructions, but to have those verbal instructions accompanied by an, oh, this makes me smile because it makes life so much easier. Some written or visual instructions, a list of what we need to do that we can see and hold will make life so, so much easier for us. I totally get that it's extra work. 
I do totally get that. And it does make life just a little bit harder. What I would say is that you're not doing this just for one or two kids that might be in your class, for example. It's actually something that will likely help many, many children. None of these ideas do any harm for anyone, for what it's worth. But you might find that quite a lot of kids would benefit from this kind of thing. Or even just noting in very, very short sentences on the board what you're saying if you're a teacher. Just sort of preventing us from having to only hold it in our head is, is really helpful and it just gives us the space and the time just to process them in our own ways and we might also welcome the opportunity to have it as a handout so we can kind of write on it draw on it annotate it our own way as well to help us to make sense of it but having multiple formats of the same thing will increase our likelihood of being able to grasp what it is that's being asked of us or being explained to us if you can and this sounds like it's just one for teachers and teaching assistants but it's actually something that can be really useful for those of you who are listening and wondering about how to support your child at home as well if there are kind of instructions or ex explanations that need to be made with your child again think about whether you can show them um, as well so you might um with small children, you can use things like role play with toys to demonstrate things as well as just speaking them. Again, you can write things down or create little handouts for them. Some of you will be using lots of um, visual type aids, which can really help with this as well. We have a whiteboard at home and we'll often write on there uh, kind of what's happening and what's expected. So rather than just telling our children and expecting them to remember and to hold that, we have it written down so everybody can see what the expectation is and it's really, really clear. But finding different ways, multiple formats of sharing the same thing will make it much more likely that you will be understood and that the children or indeed adults that you're supporting will respond and develop in the way that you're hoping. The final idea that I want to share, number six, is give me time. So as the neurodiverse person that you are caring for, working with, teaching, talking to, I just need a little bit more time than my neurotypical peers. So don't move too quickly on. It just might take me time. And do you know what? If you give me time, I might just be brilliant. I might do an amazing job, but you might need to temper your expectations a little bit on how much I can get done. For many neurodiverse people, we do better when you expect fewer, better things of us. So allowing us to go deep, to really grab onto that understanding once we have it and to really run with it, get into the flow and really go with it rather than keep on, keep on, keep on moving us on. It's one of the reasons why school, I think, is such a challenging place where we're always moving from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. When you think about some of the processing challenges that we've touched on in this episode, and you think about what that looks like when you're going from half an hour of maths to an hour of English to half an hour of science to break where we've got all those questions of what's going on in the world too, to then going into, uh, I don't know, reading session, and then we've got life skills, and then we've got and on and on and on. I mean, it's just moving from thing to thing to thing to thing. And probably I'm still thinking about what happened in the very first lesson of maths. Maybe there was a social interaction that happened and I'm still dwelling on whether I got that right, whether I came across as a weirdo, whether I made appropriate gestures and eye contact and everything else is kind of passing me by and I'm gradually getting to a point of overwhelm. So give me space, give me time, Please don't kind of pressure and push me to hurry up. That is the worst thing. When you feel that pressure that you've got to get through this more quickly, your brain goes into that kind of trauma response, fight, flight, freeze, faint. And it tends to be then that our speaking, thinking brain kind of shuts down. All the processing of what you've said to us is kind of gone on the back burner because we're ready to run or we're going into shutdown or something. So hurrying us tends to trigger that kind of anxious trauma type response and it's totally, totally counterproductive. I'd have to say, as a mother of amazing neurodiverse children, when you have things that need to be understood, need to be done, need to be followed, places to be, it's very tempting in all of our day-to-day -day interactions just to try and hurry them up. It can be enough to make you feel quite on edge yourself, but... Experience tells me that the best way is to be calm, to be consistent, to be caring 
and to give them space. And generally, they will do these things more quickly than with repeated reminding and hurrying and harrying, much as the repeated reminding and hurrying and harrying comes very, very naturally. So there we go. Six ideas to support your neurodiverse children, adults, people in your life when communicating with them so their brains don't melt and remembering that that breaks rule number one. So we're going to use concrete language. We are going to say what we mean. We are going to keep it short and simple. We're just going to say what we actually need to and no more. And we're going to break it down into little chunks. We're going to talk and then we're going to stop and create some space. We're going to repeat what we've said if we feel that that's necessary and we're going to check for understanding, only rephrasing what we've said if invited to do so by the child. We're going to share what we say in multiple formats so the child has different opportunities to process things in different ways. We might use uh, visual or written communications as well as verbal communications, for example. And finally, we are going to just alter our expectations a little bit of what our neurodiverse person can get done in a given time frame. And we're going to give them the gift of time, expecting them, if possible, to do fewer things better rather than many, many, many things. Hopefully there are some ideas in here that you can pick up and run with when supporting the neurodiverse people in your life. Or maybe there are some ideas that as a neurodiverse person, you can share with others to help them to help you. I originally started putting these ideas together to support support staff with the children in their classrooms. But as I wrote it, I realized these are things that bosses need to hear when working with their autistic employees, for example, as well. Or that friends need to hear when out with their ADHD friends. There are so many of us that can benefit from communicating in this way, I believe. Good luck with it. As ever, contact me on the socials at Pookie H to let me know your ideas. What would you add? How did you use it? And so on. And I look forward to seeing you, hearing you, talking at you again next time. Over and out. Mm -hmm.